So good evening and welcome to the 45th annual George E.P. Mountcastle, Mountcastle Lecture. Um, before I start, I just want to remind everybody, adults and, and students alike, um, silence phone, please, and, and refrain if you can, if you will, from taking your phones out of your pockets during, during the lecture. That would be fantastic. So thank you. Gentlemen, please model that behavior for the adults in the, in the house tonight. So I'm, I'm glad everyone's here. A special welcome to visitors to Gilman tonight. Thank you for being here. I always like to take a, a brief moment just to thank, even in their absence, the Mountcastle family Mrs. Mountcastle and, and now the late Dr. Mountcastle for making this lectureship possible in their son George's honor. There's a lot of information about the, the background to this lectureship and your program, but I'll just hit a couple of points I think are worth mentioning every year. George Mountcastle was a 1968 graduate of Gilman, and while he was here, um, among being a scholar and an athlete, he was also a great um, lover and, and one who appreciated good writing and poetry. He won the Armstrong Prize, Prize for Poetry at graduation or commencement. And he wrote the poem, The Wonder Still Time, um, in 1967 while still at, at Gilman. He went on to Harvard from here and his focus there during his, his relatively brief, sadly, his brief time that was in modern literature. He died during his sophomore year at Harvard in 1969. And we're fortunate, and I think all in, in one way or another, touched by the fact that his legacy lives on through his family's gift of this lectureship to us. And so for that, we are very appreciative. So without further ado, what I'm gonna do is turn things over to Mr. Rowell, who will introduce tonight's speaker. So let's hear from Mr. Wow. Thank you again for being here. Well, it is my great pleasure tonight to welcome our 2015 Mount Castle speaker, Joanna Rakoff, to Gilman School to this stage. She joins a long line of distinguished and accomplished writers in this series, and I am very pleased that she is here with us tonight. Ms. Rakoff's novel, A Fortunate Age, won the Goldberg Prize for Jewish Fiction by Emerging Writers and the L. Readers Prize, and was a New York Times Editor's Choice in the San Francisco Chronicle bestseller. She has written for the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Vogue, and other publications. Her most recent work, My Salinger Year, is a memoir and coming-of-age story that recounts the time she spent as an assistant to the storied literary agent of J.D. Salinger. The book was named a finalist for the 2014 Goodreads Choice Awards, and Ms. Rakoff, who lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, snowy Cambridge, Massachusetts, joins us here at Gilman in the midst of an international author tour. Last summer, I had the experience of basically losing two entire days, two wonderful days, I might add, to reading my Salinger year, which at that time had just been published to enthusiastic, often ecstatic reviews. I knew of Joanna and some of her work, but I will admit, as a Salinger file, I primarily seized upon the title, and also I think upon the arresting cover and artwork, uh, comprised of an evocative and eye-catching photographic collage of rear courtyard views of various New York City apartment buildings, their open windows revealing tantalizing glimpses of the lives being lived within. So, yes, I judged this book by its title and its cover, but I bought it and I read it. Lives being lived within. That very phrase could partly describe what it means to be a writer, to live lives within, to walk through the world, Walt Whitman-like, looking, observing, 
and empathizing with unsuspecting souls, notating their best and their worst behaviors, and pouring those observations and feelings into words, into prose. But to write a memoir is to truly look inside, to examine one's own life and inventory one's own experience, and to transform that experience, to craft it into a story that will eventually be read by millions of strangers. Think of the risk of exposure. Think of the bravery it takes to be that vulnerable. At the beginning of the book, Ms. Rakoff quotes the writer Abigail Thomas, who describes memoir as the truth as best she can tell it, to which Ms. Rakoff adds, this book is indeed the truth told as best I could. Minor adjustments aside, this is the actual story of my sound dream year. And what a story it is. Wry, funny, poignant, a beautifully composed coming of age narrative that is destined to leave an indelible impression on readers everywhere. And in my estimation, certainly to become a classic of the form. In my Salinger year, a 23-year-old Joanna Raycock sets out in the world to make her way as a full-fledged adult, a sobering rite of passage that a few of us in this room have already experienced, and one that many of you in this room, perhaps most of you, eventually will. As the book begins, Joanna is a fledgling, mostly unpublished writer who lands a first grown-up job in a venerable Manhattan literary agency as an assistant to the agent who represents the great but complicated J.D. Salinger. This is the book's jumping off place to a multi-layered tale of a year of great personal discovery for the author. A year in which young Joanna's eyes are opened to the extraordinary world of literary New York and many of its key players. Famous, talented authors who also happen to be needy and neurotic. Agents who chase big, big figure contracts for clients in a world which increasingly doesn't seem to value books as much as it once did and all the editors, junior editors, assistants, agents, and sub-agents who seem to be in a constant flux of moving up or down, in and out of the publishing rapids. <laughs> Against this chaotic but hopelessly romantic <laughs> canvas, a vintage hand-drawn New Yorker cover coming to cinematic life, Ms. Rakoff paints a touching portrait of her younger self and unflinchingly looks back at who she once was and who she became in the course of one singularly tumultuous year. How fortunate we are that she is here tonight to share some of that experience with us. Please join me in welcoming to the stage this year's Mount Hassel lecturer, Joanna Rick. Introduction. Thank you. Um, thank you guys so much for having me, for being here. It's such an incredible pleasure and honor. When John wrote to me to ask me um, to do this, I looked at the list of um, people who appeared before me and thought, oh my god, me, really? Because I still sometimes, uh, this book is supposedly about my attempting to become an adult, and I still, all these years later, I'm not sure that I actually am one, um, despite the fact that I was able to walk up this um, set of stairs in heels. Um, Anyway, but you're all men. You don't know about that. Um, okay. <laughs> so be before I start, just to continue this, thank you. I just want to say, um, so I had the privilege today of spending a bunch of time with some of your English teachers and um, visiting winter classes, and um, you know, having gone to high school myself, I just want to say you guys are so lucky. Um, it, I I taught high school myself for a while, and. You know, I've taught freshman English and spent as much you know time in high schools as a person uh, could, and you just have amazing people teaching you. And um, wow! So anyway, it's it's such a privilege to be here. Okay, so um, this is called a lecture, but I'm not a huge lecturer. I am. Um, you probably all are thinking about college, and I. For college, I went to uh, Oberlin um, College, which some of you might be thinking about. It's a place where there are not a lot of lectures, and I chose it partly for that reason. 
Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk to you a bit, and, um, and we'll just call it a lecture. Okay. So, so my challenger here, um, as Mr. Ralph um, has, has told you, um, chronicles this one calendar year in my life. Um, it, it really does indeed start right after the new year in 1996, and um, I have this job in this agency um, through through that year. And there's a funny um, irony here, because you know, we've just gone through, it, up north, we've just gone through this, this huge blizzard, and um, in, in a way, um, it, it's, it's kind of oddly fitting, because my first day of work at this agency was um, actually the day that there was the, the last great blizzard in New York when everything was shut down. It was the last, um, it, so in 1996, this blizzard completely shut New York down. However, um, now we all have smartphones and we're all sort of endlessly connected and what have you. So if a blizzard shuts a city down, you know about it and you know what's going on. But in 1996, we didn't. And so I um, had interviewed for and got this job right around Christmas and then the office <coughs> shut down and I went off and you know had the holidays. And the first work day after the new year, I knew it was my first day at work and I got up early and got dressed in this very nervous way and uh, I didn't even know, I didn't own a radio or a TV, if you can imagine. Um, and I um, you know, lived in this kind of very bare bones bohemian apartment in Brooklyn and I looked out the window and I was like, oh, there's a lot of snow and um, stepped out my front door and I noticed there was nobody else on the street at all, not one person. Walked to the subway, didn't encounter another person got on the subway, and um, there, were, there wasn't anyone on the subway, but it was running, and got off the subway at Grand Central. Have any of you guys been to Grand Central Station in New York? A lot of you. Okay, so you, you can imagine, what is it normally like? There are like eight million people racing around. So I got out of the subway at Grand Central and walked into the Great Hall, you know, the main hallway where there were sort of stars above it, and there was no one there. I was the only person in Grand Central, the only person, one person, me. And I thought, there's something wrong here. Maybe I shouldn't be going to work today. And I, I left I left Grand Central and walked up to my office, and there's no one on the street at all. It was just me walking through, you know, enormous drifts of snow. I got to my office and it was in fact closed. And um, so anyway, that was my first day of work. Okay. So <laughs> so now that we've had this huge blizzard again, it really actually has brought me back to that time that the New York Times published um, a photo of Grand Central on um, Monday and it was completely empty and I thought, oh my god, someone else, that photographer for the New York Times experienced what I experienced with the two people in the world who've been in Grand Central, but it was completely empty. Okay, anyway, moving on to Salinger and things that are more pertinent to, to all of this. So anyway, okay, I had so I worked at this agency for a year. Um, I started off as potentially the most naive, clueless human who has ever set foot in an office. Um, I did not know, when I interviewed for the job, I didn't know what a literary agency was. Do, do, does any, who, do you guys know what a literary agency is? Any of you? No one, okay. You know what a literary agency is? Okay, excellent. Uh, one person out of me. So I didn't, so maybe it, it's not that weird. Um, if you live in New York and you're part of the kind of media world, like maybe your parents work at a magazine or in publishing, then maybe you know what it is, but most people, I suppose, don't. Um, a literary agent um, is basically sort of like a writer's manager or a writer's broker. So the writer writes the book, or in the case of a nonfiction book, you write a proposal for a book, a little thing saying, here's what this book is going to be, maybe with a sample chapter, depending on who you are and what, what they need from you. You write the book, and then your agent sells the book to publishers, and then the publishers, who you've probably heard of Random House, Knopf, people like that, they, um, they, put the, they make the book. You work with an editor there, and they make the book and put it out to the world, and they also you know, have marketing people and publicity people and that kind of thing. So the agent is like the intermediary. And you've probably, like, I don't know, seen Entourage? Yeah, yeah so like, whatever, it's Ari Gold, him. Right, so that's the same thing, but for writers. Um, so what I had no idea once was I took this job 
having literally no clue. Um, and I got to the office on, on the first, on my second day. The first day I got there and there was no one there and they had given me a key to the office. So I let myself in. I sat down at my desk. I was <coughs> completely soaking wet if I had just taken a shower. And I um, was thinking, how am I going to survive this day? Completely soaking wet and freezing. And eventually my boss called and said, you know, what are you doing there? Why did, why did you come in? The whole city is closed, go home. Except in a somewhat more unpleasant uh, way, because that was her, her way of being. Um, my, my first real day of work, I got there and my boss, who was this kind of grand dame, sort of lady who, you know, I thought this kind of lady only existed in New York, but we just had dinner um, um, at a French restaurant nearby, and there were some ladies that were kind of like my boss at that restaurant. So she was the kind of lady who um, would, would sort of sweep into the office wearing an enormous fur coat with huge sunglasses on, smoking a cigarette. She was never without a cigarette, and she smoked this very old-fashioned brand of long brown cigarettes called Moors. And so she would arrive at the office with her cigarette in hand and a cup of coffee and just kind of walk past me as if I were furniture. So my first day I didn't understand what was going to happen and I thought that, because I had gone to Overland and I thought that everyone was my friend, um, I, I thought that you know she was going to be my friend and that she wanted me to say hi to her, but no, that was not at all. This was a much more old-fashioned office. So I you know, I sort of sat there and she walked in and I stood up and said, you know, hello, how are you, good morning. And she just kind of breezed past me as if I were, you know, made of stone or just a piece of office equipment or something. And so anyway, time goes on, she's sort of um, in her office smoking and she comes out and says to me, um, do you, you know, you know what a dictaphone is, don't you? And I. I didn't know what to say because I had no idea. Do you know what a dictaphone is? Anyone? No, not really. No, no one does. No one knows what a dictaphone is. So a dictaphone was a piece of, of um, was a sort of state of the art piece of office equipment in like the 1950s. And um, this office. So here was my first clue. That this office was a little bit weird. So it's 1996, and they're still using this thing called a dictaphone, which is basically allows my boss. <coughs> to kind of record letters um, and then hand me the tapes and I transcribe them using, and here again, 1996 might seem like a very long time ago to you, but I swear to you that all offices had computers then, except for this office in which they had 35 year old typewriters. And so I was given you know, the dictaphone tape, shown the dictaphone and shown this enormous typewriter. I couldn't even figure out how to turn it on. It was so big and there were so many buttons on it and it, it was just terrible. And um, someone finally came by and showed me how to use all these things. And um, I thought, oh my God, what have I done? Why am I here? I don't know how to type. I, don't, I can't do this, but I did. So anyway, it's kind of a classic first job experience. You get there and you're like, this is completely different than anything I've ever had to do before and I can't do it, but then you, you do and it's all fine. Okay, so that is basically the setup. No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a few sections from the book and as is my want, I'm going to interrupt myself to explain who people are and what things are um, as I go. So, so basically, we're still on my first day at work because it was so utterly traumatic for me. Um, so I spent the whole I spent the whole morning typing, having you know no idea what I was doing, but thinking that I was doing okay. Um, and I should add here that I had lied to get this job. Um, I had been sent to this agency um, by what's known as a headhunter, a person who sort of placed people in jobs in publishing. And um, she said to me, "You can't type, can you?" And I, I said, "No, I can't type." And she was like, it's okay, no one of your generation can type. You were raised on computers, don't worry about it. But you need to type for this job. So when you go to the interview, just lie. And um, I'm a, a, a terrible liar. And I said, you know, I can't lie. And she said, just trust me, you have to lie. And I found out later that she had been trying to place someone in this job for months. And it had taken her a while to figure out that, she, that everyone was being rejected because my the person who became my boss would say, can you type? And the candidate would say, no, I can't type. And they would just be dismissed outright because you had to type to have this job. So finally, I arrived at the headhunter's office at the right moment. She had figured this out. 
and he was like, just lie, because I need my commission. I need to place someone in this job. So, okay. So I've been typing all morning, and my boss is in this office near me, and she's been smoking all morning, and um, I've developed this terrible headache, and it's now about three o'clock, and I, having never had a job before, sort of thought that someone was going to come and say to me, it's time for lunch, go take your lunch. It's lunchtime, like a whistle would blow or something, or they would be like, punch out now, or I don't know what I thought. And, but nobody said this, and so I was growing increasingly hungry and cranky. And finally, this uh, man who's kind of like the sort of curator of this agency, um, he had kind of memorized all of the agency's records and archives. And I should stop and explain here that this agency represented all the great writers of the 1920s, 30s, 40s. So like, F people you've read, like F. Scott Fitzgerald, Langston Hughes, um, Dylan Thomas, also people like Agatha Christie. So he, this guy had sort of knew everything about all these writers and their contracts and what have you. So he finally came by and said, you know, go get a sandwich. And I was like, I can't, I haven't finished all this typing. And he said, you know, you have like weeks of typing to do. Just don't worry about it, go get a sandwich. And this is what happens when I go out to get a sandwich. To show you how clueless I was. Okay. Out on Madison, I found myself gazing through the windows of a chain sandwich shop. It's wares too much for me, because everything was too much for me. I had nothing. A few dollars my father had slipped me, which had to last until my first paycheck, which I presume would come at the end of the week. I didn't even have a bank account in New York yet. I had so little money, there seemed no point. So I, I had been in grad school in London, I'd been in a doctoral program, and I dropped out, much to everyone's annoyance and embarrassment. Um, everyone being my parents, who were like, okay, you've dropped out, now you have to get a job. We're not going to help you in any way. So here's a suit, go get a job. Um, my account in London was still open and there was some cash in it, but I wasn't sure how much or how to access it in this pre-electronic era. My wallet held two credit cards, but these I reserved for emergencies, and it didn't occur to me that I might use them for anything but, that I might use them for something as unnecessary as lunch no matter how hungry I was. I would, I decided, simply buy a cup of coffee in an hour, a couple of dollars at most. On the west side of Madison, I turned into a deli and inspected a vast pile of overripe bananas. What you like, called the white clad man behind the sandwich counter, smiling. Turkey on a hard roll, I said, without really intending to, my heart beating with the recklessness of this gesture. Provolone, lettuce, tomato, and a little mayo, just a little. I think I thought that they were going to charge me for the mail or something. Um, at the register, I handed over a 10 and was given two dollars and two quarters back, several dollars more than I'd expected to spend on so humble a sandwich. My pulse quickened with regret. Five dollars was lunch. Seven fifty? Seven fifty was dinner. Back at my desk, I set down my sandwich and slipped off my coat. As I pulled out my chair to sit down, my boss appeared in the doorway to her office. Oh good, you're back, she said. Come in and have a seat. We have some things to talk about. Glancing sadly at my sandwich wrapped tightly in white butcher paper, I walked into her office and sat down in one of the straight back chairs that faced her desk. So, she said, settling in her own chair behind that vast expanse of a desk, we need to talk about Jerry. I nodded, though I had no idea who Jerry was. People are going to call and ask for his address, his phone number. They're going to ask you to put them in touch with him, or me. She laughed at the ridiculousness of this. Reporters will call, students, graduate students. She rolled her eyes. She knew, of course, that I'd just been a graduate student like a day before. Um, they'll, they'll say they want to interview him or give him a prize or an honorary degree or who knows what. Producers will call about the film rights. They'll try to get around you. They may be very persuasive, very manipulative, but you must never. Behind her huge, heavy glasses, her eyes narrowed, and she leaned across the desk like a caricature of a gangster, her voice taking on a frightening edge. Never, never, never give out his address or phone number. Don't tell them anything. Don't answer their questions. 
Just get off the phone as quickly as possible. Do you understand? I nodded. Never, ever, ever for you to give out his address or phone number. I understand, I told her, though I wasn't sure I did, as I didn't know who Jerry was. This was 1996, and the first Jerry that came to mind was Seinfeld, who presumably wasn't a client of the agency, though one never knew, I suppose. Okay, she said, sitting back in her chair. You understand. Now go. I'm going to take a look at your correspondence. That's what they called your typing. So I would type all these letters, and they referred to it as your correspondence, even though none of it came from me. It was just, this is your correspondence. So, and so for the first week that I was there, I had no idea what they were talking about. I felt like, did I write letters in my sleep and I don't remember it? What is my correspondence? Anyway, um, I'm going to take a look at your correspondence. She gestured to the pile of letters I typed, neatly stacked on her desk. Seeing them, oddly, gave me a little rush of pride. They were so beautiful, that heavy yellow bond crowded with letters and inky black. As I left her office, smoothing my skirt, I happened to glance at the bookcases directly to the right of her doorway, on the wall opposite the side of my desk that held the typewriter. I'd been staring at that bookcase all day, staring at it without seeing it, so focused was I on my typing. The case held books in corresponding hues, mustard, maroon, turquoise, imprinted with bold black type. I'd seen these books countless times, in my parents' bookcase and the English department closet at my high school, at every bookstore and library I'd ever visited, and of course, in the hands of friends. <clears throat> I'd never read them myself, to at first purely to happenstance, then to conscious choice. Books so ubiquitous on the contemporary bookshelf, I barely noticed them. Catcher in the Rye, Brandon and Zoe, Nine Stories, Salinger, the agency represented J.D. Salinger. I'd reached my desk before it hit me. Oh, I thought, that Jerry. So, okay. So the day after this happened, after the uh, don't give out his address talk happened, <coughs> my boss called me back into her office and very scarily explained that um, often assistants in taking this job were aware of the fact that Salinger was a client of the agency and took the job thinking that he was going to become their friend. And they were going to become buddies with him and be like, hey, Jerry, I've written a novel. Would you read it for me? And that kind of thing. And um, some people had been fired because of things like this. And so she gave me this very strict warning, you know, basically saying, he's never going to call, first of all. He doesn't call. You're, you know, and if he does call, he's going to be put through directly to me. You're, he's, you're not going to be sitting at your desk and pick up the phone, and it's J.D. Salinger. So just get that out of your head. And, um, but, she, you know, but nevertheless, he's not going to call at all. So just forget it. He never comes into the office. No contact. He's not working on anything new. Nothing. Just forget it. And then, an hour or two later, the phone rang, and it was him. And and so it, it turned out that this year that I worked to the agent. So what she said was indeed true. And for decades at that point, um, or more than a decade at that point, he had not called. He had not come in. He was a recluse, and he wanted the agency to kind of protect him from the world. He wasn't that interested in closely overseeing his business or looking at you know, his royalty statements or anything at all. And he wasn't producing new work, so there wasn't that much for them to do. So it turned out that he had um, this idea that he was going to publish a new book. So it was 1996, as I said, in 1998, I'm sorry, 1988, so eight years earlier, um, publisher in Virginia, a man who ran his own small press, had written to Salinger, um, and the fact that he got through to him was amazing. He just wrote to him, like, care of the post office in Cornish, New Hampshire, where Salinger lived. And somehow, this letter got to him, and he said, your last story, which was this very long story from half 16, 1929, um, your last story has never been published in book format. Your readers and your fans, I think, would really like this. Can I publish it in book format? And Salinger thought about it for eight years and then um, called the day after I started working there to tell my boss that he wanted to do this, that he wanted this tiny press that 
this man basically operated out of his basement to um, publish this book for him. So, um, you know, I was quite young at the time, and I didn't really understand why my boss thought this was such a bad idea. Um, I felt like, small presses are great, that's amazing, how cool, how cool of Salinger to, to let a small press do this. But of course, Salinger's books have sold hundreds of millions of copies, and this, is a, this was this little press that would sell a few hundred copies of a book. So my boss knew that this man wasn't really equipped to do this. Regardless, Salinger liked this man, they became friends, um, and um, we proceeded with this. And so previous assistants you know, had, had no contact with Salinger. I, by luck or happenstance or whatever, ended up speaking to him at least once a week. Um, and there's a whole added layer to this that I, you'll have to read the book to find out, but which is that my boss was out of the office for some months, but we were pretending that she wasn't out of the office, that a sort of terrible tragedy befell her and she was gone. And so I sort of had to front her, I had to pretend that she was still there. So Salinger would call and he would be put through to me because the office, you know, they didn't have computers, they also didn't have voicemail. So um, can you imagine that? A world without, not just without cell phones, but no voicemail, no answering machine. If somebody called and the receptionist had gone to the bathroom, the phone would just ring and ring and ring. So there was no, there was, she didn't have voicemail that Salinger could be put through to, to he was just put through to me. So I sort of got to know him, and that's a lot of what the book is about. Um, but anyway, this is a little moment um, for when I, you'll see. Just, here we go. Okay. How many times had I been told that Salinger would not call, would never call, that I would have no contact with him, more than I could count? And yet, one morning, a Friday, at the beginning of April, I picked up the phone and heard someone shouting at me, Hello! Hello! Then something incomprehensible. Hello! Hello! More gibberish. Slowly, as in a dream, the gibberish resolved into language. It's Jerry! The caller was shouting. Oh my god, I thought. It's him. I began slightly to quiver with fear, not because I was talking to or being shouted at by the actual J.D. Salinger, but because I so feared doing something wrong and incurring my boss's wrath. My mind began to sift through all the Salinger-related instructions that had been imparted to me, but they more had to do with keeping others away from him, <coughs> less to do with the man himself. There was no risk of my asking him to read my stories or gushing about the catcher in the rye. I still hadn't read it. Who is this? he asked, though it took me a few tries to understand. It's Joanna, I told him. Nine or ten times, yelling at the top of my lungs by the final three. I'm the new assistant. Well, nice to meet you, Suzanne, he said, finally, in something akin to a normal voice. I'm calling to speak to your bo boss. I had assumed as much. Why a Pam, this is the receptionist, why had Pam put him through to me rather than taking a message? My boss was out for the day, it being Friday, her reading day. So I'll just, you know, agents on Fridays often take this thing called their reading, a reading day, where they're supposed to read through manuscripts, but my boss, you know, wasn't really taking on her clients, so she didn't really have that much reading to do, so who knows what she did. Anyway, she, she was not there. Um, I conveyed this to him, or hoped that I did. I can call her at home and have her call you back today, or she can give you a call when she gets in on Monday. Monday is fine, he said. His voice ratcheted down another notch. Well, very nice to meet you, Suzanne. I hope we meet in person someday. Me too, I said. Have a great day. This was not a phrase I ever used. Where had it come from? You too! Ah, uh, the shouting, again. I put the phone down and took a deep breath, as I learned to do in ballet. My entire body, I realized, was shaking. I stood up and stretched. Jerry, asked Hugh. So this is the kind of office manager guy, sort of office manager curator who knows the whole history of the office and sort of has it lodged in his head. Um, Jerry, asked Hugh stepping out of his office with a mug of coffee. Yes, I said. Wow. He's deaf, he explained. His wife set up this special phone for him with an amplified receiver, but he refuses to use it. Hugh sighed his trademark sigh. To be Hugh was to be let down by the world. What did Jerry want? Just to talk to my boss, I shrugged. I offered to call her at home and have her call him back, but he said Monday was fine. 
Hugh wrinkled his face in thought. Hmm, why don't you call her anyway? I think she'd want to know who called. Okay, I said, thumbing through my Rolodex. Rolodexes, those people use those. <laughs> They don't exist anymore. Um, my boss wasn't home and had no answering machine. She didn't believe in them, just as she didn't believe in computers or voicemail, another newfangled invention not employed by the agency. If you called during business hours, you reached Pam, the receptionist. If you called outside hours, the phone just rang and rang, as it did in my boss's apartment that day, 20 blocks north of the office. I tried again every hour or so until the end of the day to no avail. It would have to be Monday. And so, of course, what happened is that she came in on Monday and started screaming at me, why didn't you tell me Jerry called? But there was nothing that I wanted to say. Why don't you get an answering machine? But I didn't say that. Okay. Um, okay, so the thing that I left out, um, I'm going to read one more session, but I realized the thing that I've left out is that um, part of the sort of plot of the book is that I, as you've heard from these sections, had not actually read Salinger. Um, and I just sort of didn't. I was talking to Mr. Rowell and a few other teachers about this um, today. I went to a high school that was very progressive, where we read like, you know, Bob Dylan lyrics instead of Shakespeare sonnets, and so somehow I just missed all this. And um, my friends read Salinger on their own, but I just was somehow. I, I thought that Salinger was kind of cute, comedic, silly stuff that wasn't interesting to me. That I wanted to read kind of serious, important fiction. I wanted to read like Dickens and Tolstoy and stuff like that. And Salinger's stories, how many of you guys have read Salinger? All of you. Did you have to read him for class? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do all boys that go to boys prep schools have to read The Catcher in the Rye? Yeah. Did you like it? Okay. Did it, okay, wait, we're gonna do, let's do this, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. Let's do this in a silent way. Did it ring true for you? Did you relate to Holden Caulfield? Raise your hand. Okay. Did, did it just seem totally dated and you were like, what is this? Why do we have to read this? Some of you. Yeah, that's a lot of you. Okay, interesting. Now, have any of you guys read <coughs> Salinger's stories? Brandy and Zoe, or Nine Stories? Any of you? A lot of you. Or, some of you. Okay. So uh, you probably know that um, some, like some of the Salinger stories, especially the early ones, have these sort of titles that are, you know, like a little bit silly, like, a, or they sound silly if you don't know what they're about, A Perfect Day for Banana Fish and that kind of thing. And I just thought they were funny. And in fact, they're all about people committing suicide and being grossly unhappy. And they're not really, I mean, some of them are funny, but they're also deeply sad. And um, and so I sort of dismissed Salinger without having read him. And I mean, part of, um, Mr. Rell talked about how this book is about me becoming an adult. And part of the way that I became, became an adult was through realizing the extent to which nothing, was, nothing can be assumed. I had assumed that Salinger's stories were one thing. And eventually I read them, and I saw they were something so completely different. And my boss, too, I thought that she was one sort of person, and it turned out she was someone very, very different. And, um, I, I, anyway, um, okay. The larger point is that one day, about a month into my tenure at the agency, the um, office manager guy dropped a bundle of letters at my desk and said, these are the Salinger letters, by the way, you have to answer them. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, these are letters from Salinger's fans. We get a ton of them. You can imagine which fan now Salinger. Well, those of you who are like, why did I have to read that book? Can't imagine. But those of you who liked it can imagine how much mail he gets. Got. Um, maybe still gets. I uh, I know there are people, I have encountered people who don't realize that he passed away. So he might still get mail. Um, so I, I said, well, how do I respond? Can I just say whatever I want? And the office manager guy said, no, are you completely insane? And sort of had a heart attack and went back to his desk and pulled out a form letter. It was this crumbling yellow piece of paper. The date on it was 1963. And the letter essentially said, you know, dear Salinger fan, dear Ms. So-and-so, thank you for your kind letter to J.D. Salinger. As you may know, Mr. Salinger does not wish to see his fan mail. Thus, we cannot pass on your kind letter to him. You know, we apologize for this. Now, listen, 
don't follow up on this response. We don't want to hear from you again. Don't call. Really, nothing. Don't show up at our office and cause a scene. Maybe you should just like find another writer to idolize if we hear that Kurt Vonnegut is kind of similar to Mr. Salinger, though we don't represent him. So if you want to write him a fan letter, phew, that's not us. So you know, like maybe stop reading, maybe take up knitting, like just leave us alone. We never want to hear from you again, go away. You're making all this work for us. So that was what the letter was like. It was this very foreboding sort of letter. And um, it seemed, I, so anyway, I, I sort of took it for what it was. I was like, okay, and put it down and immediately started opening up the letters and reading them. And they were from all over the world. They were from Japan, Sweden, Sri Lanka. There were many men. I just actually came back from a tour of India. There were so many letters from India. Salinger is insanely popular in India. I have no idea why. And tons of letters from Germany, France, everywhere, everywhere, every part of the US, every part of the world. Hundreds of letters, handwritten letters with like people, they had like cut off pieces of their hair and taped them to the letters. Like, typed letters that were, you know, laser printed, letters written on Hello Kitty stationery, you know, everything, every possible person in the world writing to Salinger. And so these letters were not like, okay, have any of you guys ever written a fan letter? Really? Okay. So, like, when I think of a fan letter, I think of something that's more this kind of just expression of adoration, like, I don't know, you know, Taylor Swift, I love you, or whatever, like, you know, you're so beautiful, I, or I want to be you, or whatever. But these letters, oh my god, they're like, why did you mention Taylor Swift? It's because I have very young children who love her. So, um, and I, they talk about her too much, because she's not played in her house. Anyway, these letters were not like that. They were not like Justin Bieber letters. They were these letters of great depth. And um, I found myself unable to send this form letter back to a lot of the fans because the letters were so moving. They were talking about like letters that discussed um, you know, the death of people's children and spouses and going through cancer and a lot of letters from World War II veterans talking about um, their experiences during the war and how Salinger had so perfectly captured what it was like to come home from the war you know, through Holden and through Seymour Glass. And so I started writing back to the fans. This is the last section I'm going to read, and then you can ask me questions. Okay. So, the next morning, I turned to the letters straight away. There were the usual proclamations of love for Holden. Wait, I'm just going to interrupt myself to say that there were this, there was this whole class of letters from teenage boys, um, many of whom seemed to be students at fancy private schools, um, <laughs> who, who wrote in the style of Holden Caulfield, so the letters were like, Dear Jerry, you old bastard. <laughs> Bet you didn't expect to get a letter from someone saying that you're the greatest living writer. Ha ha, here it is. You know, and my pal Steve, he's, he's crumb on. We, you know, we were out, you know, cruising for girls. Or That's not exactly right. But anyway, there were letters like that. And they were hilarious, but they were also heartbreaking. And because uh, so much time, they were like fan fiction, basically, but fan fiction didn't exist then. So anyway, okay, so here we go. There were the usual proclamations of love for Holden, the usual war stories, the usual stories of despair and redemption, the many, many letters from Japan and Denmark and the, leather, the Netherlands. The Japanese loved Holden. I tapped out a few form responses and modified form responses, filed away a few tragic letters for another day, then slid open an envelope addressed in bubbly girlish script. The letter was almost a novella unto itself. <laughs> this girl's story unfolding over three pages of wrinkly, pencil-smudged notebook paper. She was a freshman in high school, she explained, and she hated school, particularly English class, which she was failing. Her English teacher was maybe an all-right person, but she didn't understand what it meant to be young, and she assigned the class these stupid books that had nothing to do with their lives. The only book the girl had liked over the course of the year was The Catcher in the Rye, of course. As things stood, she was going to have to go to summer school or repeat freshman English, which would be so embarrassing. She wasn't sure if she could stand it, and her mother would kill her. The year was almost over, but she'd asked her teacher if she could do anything at all to bring her grade up, just enough so that she'd pass. There is something you can do, the teacher told her. Write a letter to J.D. Salinger and make it good enough that he'll write back. If he writes back, I'll give you an A.
Has anyone ever told you that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, hmm, I thought, putting the letter down and staring for the millionth time at the wall of sound or books. It was lunchtime, and I had a neat stack of letters ready to be mailed. I ran them through the postal meter, threw on my coat, and slipped the girl's letter in my on my bag. I'm lined by my salad. Every, so every day I ate the same thing because I had no money, so the only thing that I could afford was the Greek salad at Oban Pan, which was the cheapest thing on their menu. So I ate the same thing every day for a year, basically. So I'm lined by my salad. I read it again. Despite various misspellings and sloppy penmanship, this girl wasn't a terrible writer. She conveyed her story vividly and honestly with passion and detail. And then there was the pure audacity, the ballsiness, the brattiness of writing to J.D. Salinger and saying, please respond so I can get a free A. I kind of liked her. Salinger had been a terrible student himself. Perhaps he would like her too. <coughs> I really need this A, I read, holding my plastic container of watery lettuce. It will bring my entire GPA up to passing. My mother is mad at me all the time now. I know you understand. And yet there, that rankled me. What would Salinger say to her? I pondered this as I walked back to the office across 49th and down Madison, the sun warming my arms. Salinger had failed out of schools himself. I knew this from the letters, many of which referred to incidents in Salinger's life. They could actually be informative, the fan letters. And Holden, I knew, had also failed out of a few schools. Would either of them have attempted to maintain his place through this kind of trick? I hadn't read Catcher, so I wasn't sure about Holden, but I knew, I knew that Salinger would not he would have taken his failure as deserved. Back at my desk, I ate an olive, then turned toward the inspector and banged out a response to the girl, suggesting that it was decidedly not in the spirit of Holden or Salinger to be worrying about grades or her mother's anger. If she wanted to be like Holden or like Salinger, she would accept her failing grade, a grade she, by her own admission, deserved. Trying to trick herself into a grade she hadn't earned was a coward's way out, a phony's way out. If you desire an A, or at least a passing grade, there's only one way to earn it. You must study and do the work assigned to you, I wrote. I really wrote that. Um, this might mean making up papers or tests. This might mean begging your teacher to give you another chance. This might mean apologizing or otherwise humbling yourself. But it is the only way. An A earned by trickery means absolutely nothing. As I signed the letter with my name, <coughs> my heart raised happily. I had done the right thing. I was mastering the art of what would Salinger say. But I had also crossed a line, the barely visible scene between bemused interest or compassionate engagement or plain sympathy <coughs> and utter over-involvement. Why could I not leave these letters alone, I asked myself as I walked over to the mail meter. Why could I not just send on form letters to every single fan? The answer was plain. I loved them. They were exciting. When I read them sitting at my desk alone on, say, a Friday morning, I felt a strange charge, a mixture of anger and affection, disdain and empathy, admiration and disgust. These people were writing to me, or, well, no, they were writing to Salinger, care of me, about their marital frustrations, their dead children, their boredom and desperation. They wrote about their favorite songs and poems, about the trips they'd taken to the Grand Canyon and Hawaii, about their favorite dolls. They told me, or I mean, they told Salinger, things I knew for sure they'd never told anyone else. Could I, over and over, respond to them in the most formal, impersonal manner possible? Could I just abandon them? Could I let them think no one cared, no one was listening? Okay, that's more than enough. Um, do you guys have questions for me? Yeah. And thank you so much.
I'm looking at having worked for an agency, a literary agency, what advice would you give um, to someone who's trying to uh, make this work? Oh, God. I mean, I guess this is so not exciting advice, but I would say just to, first of all, read as much as you can, um, and sort of read like you're taking a clock apart. Like if you're trying to write short stories, read every possible short story, like the whole breadth of short stories, you know, from Chekhov to whoever was published yesterday, you know, and just endlessly read and try, which is actually what Salinger did, we were just talking about this, like he read and read and read and read short stories and tried to master that form. Um, if you're trying to write essays, same thing. If you're trying to write a novel, which I hope you are, same thing. And then to just force yourself to sit down every day and write. And once, like that's the most important thing, and the real truth, having worked at agencies, is that good work gets published. Like you hear people say like, oh, I worked on this thing forever, and then no one would publish it, and whatever, and not, not to be you know, really sort of like scary, but really the truth is that if something is good and publishable, it will, it will get published, and people will read it, and it will be out there. Um, I, def I really, really did find that, and do, do find that. You know, most of my friends are writers, and it, the, the hardest part is just actually doing the work, sitting down and writing, you know? Um, and maybe, I mean, I'm assuming you're figuring out where you're gonna go to school in the fall, but maybe, you know, choose a place that has a really good writing faculty, if you can, because it really helps, really helps tremendously. It can shape your life. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hi, I'm Gus Manny. I'm a, a junior. I was just wondering, um, since I, I haven't read your book yet, although it sounds great, um, I was wondering if you kind of tried to incorporate any of Salinger's style into the book. That's a really good question. Um, I did not consciously, and I'm a Salinger, so if you read the book, you'll see I do eventually read all of Salinger's work, and it has this profound effect on me. And um, I, to this day, am an enormous Salinger fan, and his work really has profoundly shaped, in a way, my life. And I reread almost, not Catcher, actually, but uh, his stories I reread probably every year, especially Franny and Zoe and Ray's Hyder with Green Carpenters. So his style and his way of telling a story and his way of putting a sentence together are kind of embedded in my brain in the same way other favorite writers' works are embedded in my brain. Pynchon, but for people who I just love. Um, and um, I think that I probably unconsciously incorporated some Salinger-esque things. I did consciously at a certain point, and I talked about this um, today um, in the class I visited, um, I, I did consciously try to incorporate, to, Salinger has a lot of silence in his short stories. They're, um, there's a lot of sort of blank space and a lot of filling things in in your own mind. He doesn't explain that much. And that's one of the things that I just love about his work. Um, but he's not trying to sort of say, well, this person did this because of this, which is a big trope in contemporary fiction, like psychologizing characters. There's nothing that I hate more. And he doesn't do that at all. And so I, um, in writing this book, wanted to have a lot of space in it. I didn't want to explain everything. Um, I wanted it to be a more sparse book. Um, so that part I did very quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Simon Everett. I'm a senior. Um, I read an interview earlier today in which you questioned the uh, um, notion that Jane Salinger's work appeals mostly to adolescents. And so I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about that and maybe um, talk about whether you might have thought differently if you read it at an earlier age. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, so as you can imagine, I've become like the repository for all people's feelings about Salinger. So I get a lot of mail myself, people telling me their feelings about Salinger, and also just any time, like now, my life has just become you know, all Salinger all the time. So Previously, if I went to, say, a cocktail party held by friends, um, I could 
could go and just talk about anything. But now, random people come up to me and are like, you're the person that wrote that Salinger book. So I read Catcher in the Rye when I was 15 and I loved it. And then I tried to read it last year and I thought it was terrible. And so it is true that I think that there is, um, that's a really common theme in, in you know, strangers coming up to tell me their feelings about Salinger is that I read it when I was younger and now I think it's direct and people are saying he's a great American writer, but he's not. And you know, if he were published today, he would be a YA writer, like J.K. Rowling or whatever. And you're like, ah. And um, so I think that there is maybe a, a classification of human who read Salinger as a teenager and identified really, really strongly and passionately with Holden Caulfield. Um, and now at age whatever, 35, 40, 50, finds you know, that it doesn't have the same resonance. So it is possible that if I had read Salinger in that way, that, that kind of passionate, like, I am Holden Caulfield, or um, I got a lot of letters from teenage girls, too, um, you know, saying, like, nobody understands me, like Holden. All the boys at my school are horrible, like Stradlater. I'm, you know, essentially like, I want Holden Caulfield to be my boyfriend. And so I didn't feel that way either. You know, I just, I was reading it as a, a person who was about to start writing a novel and who, you know, was looking at what he was doing and just sort of lost myself in that book and in, in the other books and um, as well. And so I think you're right. I think it is, there is the possibility that for some people, um, you know, the appeal of, say, the Catcher in the Rye was this kind of, this person has encapsulated my kind of adolescent fury. And when that fury is gone, there's nothing left um, in terms of um, enjoyment of, of his work or appreciation of it. But I personally don't, I, I, I mean, I can't say, oh, those people are wrong, those are their feelings, but I feel that his work is, is truly, you know, like in the canon, and is, um, it's, I'll just say this. If you step back and you look at what was going on in literature in America in the 1950s, when Salinger started publishing, his work is completely different <coughs> than anything else that was happening at that time. It was revolutionary. And, you know, it was bombastic, like Catcher in the Rye is a bombastic, novel that just completely, you know, kind of grabs you by the throat and you know, sort of says, listen to me, you know, I have things to say. And um, American fiction at that time almost, if you look at what was really, really popular at the time that Catcher in the Rye came out, a lot of those, the novels that were hugely popular or like winning huge prizes at the time, they read like almost like Victorian romance novels, like they're completely unreadable today, popular fiction of that day. And so he really was doing something that was unlike anything that had come before him. And he really was, I, I believe, responding to, you know, the vast changes brought by World War II, um, not just in America, but in the world. So <coughs> that's my case for Salinger as a great American writer. Thanks so much. Hi. 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 Yeah, you know, it's funny, I think, so I first wrote um, a version of this. I wrote an essay on that covers some of the material in the book more than 10 years ago. I think <coughs> maybe about 12 years ago, it doesn't matter. And before I wrote that essay, people had been sort of pressuring me to do it and saying, oh, that's such a great story, you answered this fan mail. I think that I was resisting it, and I resisted it for a few years, and I think that, that was partly part of the reason why. But part of the reason also, honestly, had to do with um, how private the agency was. That um, the agency was very much, um, they almost kind of modeled themselves on Salinger. There was so much about protecting his privacy and they're protecting their own sort of strange institutional culture that I felt, I felt a bit, because like, I loved them, I, I felt kind of like I was betraying them by writing about them. But what I eventually realized was that um, I love them. And so even if I, you know, even my boss, who could be scary, and you know, I didn't understand, understand where she was 
coming from. Um, it all, I, I realized that if you write something, this is going to sound really cheesy, but if you're writing something from a place of actual of love or, or respect, um, you're not doing anything wrong. You know, if you're writing something from a place of hatred um, or disdain, then you're, maybe you are doing something wrong and you should question what you're doing. But um, I don't know if, if I, it's hard for me. People have said to me, what do you think Salinger would think about this book? And I, it may be incredibly naive of me, but I feel like he would be totally fine with it. There's nothing in here. Like, what, what is there in here that would, if he, unless he were a lunatic, and he didn't seem like a lunatic to me. So, go for it. Hi, my name is Dietrich Mayer, and I'm sitting here. Thank you. And my, my, my question was, did you have a uh, genie tell me that? Like, I don't want to be sort of like, like you know, but, uh, It's okay. Yeah. If genie tell me ever found out, like, if he had, like, what you know, about it, was he like, inspired? Was he like, did he make him want to be on the stand? Wait, say that again? Like, did he, was he, I'm not sure about this, but did he ever find out? And if so, oh. like, he didn't find out. As far as I know, um, I was, if you know, if you read the book, um, you'll see he, I eventually meet him. He comes into the office, and there's this part of me that wants to, like, run up and hug him and tell him, because I felt kind of close to him, and, but I just almost wanted to tell him, like, I've been answering your fan mail, and some of these letters are so great. Could you just read them? I think you'll like them if you read them. And it took years for me to understand why he didn't want to see his fan mail, you know, and which was because um, it, it was so, it was such, a, it was such an emotional burden to read all of these letters. And, um, you know, the, the person who passed the letters on to me said to me, you don't have to read them, don't worry about it, just don't, you, can, you should skim them, because if there are crazy people who are, like, threatening Salinger's life, we have to tell the FBI, but, you know, just don't, don't read them. And that was why, because it, because he knew that these letters, so many of them were just very intense. And Salinger tried actually for years to answer all his own fan mail like, in a really wonderful, kind of conscientious and sweet way. And then it just became too much for him. So anyways, at the, but at the time I thought like, if he just read these letters, he would love them. And he would be totally fine with my answering them. But as far as I know, he never found out. My name is Nathan Davis. I am also a student. Um, my question was, uh, since the um, since the events of the story and transition to when they're actually um, published in the book, um, since that was like 18 years or a long time, um, what was the specific moment like the impetus to get you to write it? Like, what was the um, what was the inspiration? For that? Now, there was no inspiration. Um, so I mentioned earlier that nonfiction books are sold on proposal. Like, you don't write the book and then have the agent sell it. I mean, sometimes you do. But um, if you're already sort of an established writer, you don't. You write this little proposal thing that gives a taste of what the book is going to be like. And so there's there's that. Um, so it's slightly more, it's less, writing a novel, you, know, you have to have this kind of in, very serious inspiration and really commit to it. Because um, most of the time you're writing it, and then the agent sells it. With a nonfiction book, it's less, it's more like you just have, to have an idea. However, to work backward, um, as those guys who heard me speak this afternoon, um, no, I I actually didn't want to write this book and I was kind of forced into writing it. And um, editors kept approaching me about writing it, you know, from the time of this first article I wrote, which came out, I think, in 2002. Um, it just kept, over the years, just kept saying, please turn this into a book, please turn, here's money, turn this into a book. And I didn't want to, um, at first, because I was working on a novel and I wanted to finish that novel. and. Um, you didn't want to be interrupted, and then just because I was, I just wasn't sure that this was a book. I thought, like, who cares about my life when I was 23? And then also because I don't, well, I, I, I shouldn't say, I'm so used to saying, I don't like memoir, but at, at the time, I didn't like memoir. I wasn't interested in memoir. I thought of myself as a fiction writer and a journalist and a critic, and it's like, memoir, that's the thing I'm never going to do. Ew. And like, I'm not, I thought of memoir something that you had to be very narcissistic. To like examine herself, and what have you, and I then, you know, was basically just convinced that this was a good idea that I should do this by my agent, and um, and also by the prospect of working with an editor who I hugely admired, um, 
And um, and so I agreed to do it. And then I spent a year not writing it because of just being unsure of what the story was and how to make this work. And how was I, what was my tone, my style to be, and what have you. And um, eventually I read, um, to go back to my advice to um, the, the first person who asked me a question, I read a zillion memoirs and I realized memoir can be fantastic. And can have all the same possibilities as a novel. It doesn't have to be this kind of boring, inwardly focused thing. Um, this kind of self-indulgent, you know, thing that has no interest to me. So I eventually, that was when the inspiration really came. It was after reading all these memoirs and doing a lot of sort of journalistic work with interviewing people and just doing a lot of hard thinking. So there was no moment where I was like, this is what I want to do. You know, it just, it was a very slow, Process, but the truth is that that is often what writing is like. You, know, you have these moments when you're working on a book, these kind of moments of um, you know, kind of ecstatic revelation where you're like, this is what happens to this character, or like, here's how I get from point A to point B. But um, often it's kind of just slow, like a slow slog. <coughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Chris Song, I'm a junior. So last year, three stories by J.D. Salinger were leaked online. Um, most notably, the Ocean Bowling Balls. Ball. Yeah. 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 I was wondering if during your time at the agency, you ever heard or read these stories? And given your first, this relation, close relationship that you developed with Salinger's fan, do you think it was right that these stories were leaked? Or do you think of Salinger's wish that they be published 50 years after his death. Do you think that wish should have been respected? Oh, God. You know, this is not the first time that I've been asked this question, and I still don't have an answer, because I just don't know. I mean, when I think about myself as a writer, it, you know, if I if I were in that position, I had stories you know, that have been published early on, um, and, and I have had things like this, even just in the most tiny way, like, you're starting off as a journalist, having no idea what I was doing, writing pieces for magazines that, you know, looking back on them were terrible, with the internet having them be dredged up, like the the magazine is now, like, puts all of the archives online, and suddenly someone says, oh, I read this piece by you from 1998, and I was like, what? Ah, and I look at it, and I'm like, oh my god, no, no. Uh, so I, I fully understand how he feels, and a lot of me thinks it is wrong. He disowned those stories. He didn't want them published as a book. You, know, you have to kind of respect that. He thought they were bad. Um, but then there's the other part of me that feels like, well, writers don't always have the best perspective on what is good and bad. And as a writer, you're always growing and changing. And you're sometimes even just your last project that you finished two years ago or three years ago seems terrible to you because you would never write it that way today. And so I'm on the fence about it, you know? Um, and I guess in a way, like we do live in, within an age in which things like this are possible, things are leaked, things are discovered and posted, and part of, the, part of what is happening in this book is that the agency, so the world <coughs> is on the cusp of, our, of the world we live in now. It's 1996. The New York Times has just launched its website. Salon has just launched. Slate, Slate is in the works. And, um, there are, suddenly blogs are starting to appear. And the world is changing. And so for, for the first time, like the agency is getting contracts that have pauses in them about electronic rights and electronic books. And they don't even know what this means, but they know that it's big and that they can't give these rights away, that it means major money. And, and so, um, I, they were basically kind of trying to rein all this in. Like, there's a moment in the book where they discover that people have been posting excerpts from *The Catcher in the Rye*, in particular, on their own. They weren't called blogs yet; their own personal web pages, what they were called. And they start writing letters to every single person who has posted a quote from Salinger on his <laughs> website or her website. I mean, it was a lot of people. So, can you imagine? It's like trying to. I don't know, like, harness all of the ants that are crawling around outside right now and, like, get them. It just was impossible. So there's also part of me that feels like we live in the world that we live in, and people are going to do things like this, and maybe it's just okay, and we have to just 
You okay with this? So much. My question is a little early dreams, but I was wondering if you ever, like, in the moment, realized that what was going on with it was the book of the story, or it was only at the time. Never. No, I never, it never, ever, ever in a million years occurred to me. But, I, you know, I sometimes feel like there are different types of writers. There are writers who need to work with need a lot of distance, and I'm definitely that writer. And then there are writers who, you know, like would go home tonight and write an article for whatever magazine about like speaking here tonight. You, you know, where is that? I have many writer friends who just chronicle everything that they do. Like every day, they're writing a piece for whatever magazine about like walking their dog or adopting a cat or anything, taking their kid to school, you know, buying a bathing suit, whatever. And I'm not one of those people. And as I walk through life, I don't think, this would be an article. You know, I, I sort of, I'm just in the moment in what I'm doing, and then years later, <laughs> it might occur to me to write about it. I think we actually have to, um, to cut that off. But gentlemen, there's a very nice reception for all of us. In, uh, <laughs>